Well, good morning. We're so grateful that you've brought the church into these rooms and we've gathered for a purpose. That purpose is to worship God for who he is and what he's done. We worship God today as a God of great joy. And so that's a reason for us to gather and to celebrate. It's the third week of Advent. And it's the week where we celebrate the joy that Christ brought into the world. In just days, we will celebrate the fact that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. But anticipating that, the joy it can bring, could be found in the words that Jesus used to close the Gospel of John when He, wrote the, when he said these things. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full.
seated. Hi, my 
name is Barbara. This is Mackenzie, Chris, Jordan, and Kelsey. And we are part of a distributed church that meets here in Lake Mary, Florida. We are early adopters in the Church of Churches, following Jesus together as we live out his mission in our community. Please join us in reading today's liturgy. Advent is the season when we gather to celebrate the birth of our Savior. It is a season of preparation and expectation, of mystery and truth. As we wait to see God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, we put ourselves in the place of God's people, who anticipated his coming thousands of years ago. We will read together the story of his incarnation. It is the story around which the church is formed. We will be reading the word of Isaiah the prophet, as he shared the joyful news of the coming Christ in Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 7 through 10, and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices, together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. We celebrate this season as the church has over the centuries with the lighting of the Advent wreath. The candles represent the light of Christ. This candle symbolizes joy, that joy which is the strength of every believer. Please pray with me. Dear Father, we gather in preparation for good news is about to be proclaimed. We gather in expectation, for joy is about to explode in our midst. We gather in celebration, for we are those people who have said yes to the manger, yes to love and flesh, yes to the one incarnate for others, yes to your wholeness. With preparation and expectation, we will celebrate your coming. Amen. 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 Would you please stand?
I don't even try to keep up with them on that last part. I just turn around and watch them. This Biggie Choir is singing all weekend. They're part of your family here. Would you thank them again for doing this? Yeah. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that we have a song of joy, joy that gathers us, joy that reminds us of who you are, joy that reminds us of what the church is, joy that gives us the reminder that we are the reflection of your nature. And so the great I am who came and claimed us with great joy so that in turn we could tell them with great joy, wherever they are, you are present. And so we come today gathered together around this truth of your nature and pray that your joy would permeate our understanding today of our community, but most of all of who you are and what you've done. Help us with that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And so it's my great joy to once again welcome you and thank you for coming and bringing the church into these various rooms here. Uh, we're, we're so grateful. If you're new to Northland, thank you for coming. We would love an opportunity to connect with you before you leave today. There's a card on the worship guide you can fill out that says new to Northland. And uh, if you have a few minutes after the service, we would love for you to stop in to the hub. It's a room that's back there off the foyer. And you'll find friendly people there who would love to get to know you. But we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to be here again next Sunday morning and tonight and tomorrow night too, by the way. Uh, but we're so glad you came at this time. We also want you to know that not only are we here in lovely Longwood, Florida, but we're gathered in a number of groups um, in various places around the world, including uh, a place you've never heard of, Oviedo, Florida. Uh, part of Northland is gathered there. There's also some distributed churches that are gathered in various communities. One in Ponce Inlet, Florida, welcome. One in Austin, Texas, welcome. One in Deland, Florida, welcome. One in San Luis, Colorado, thank you. One in Venice, Florida. See, you could do my job, it's not that hard. But we're so glad that all of you folks are gathered together and especially want to extend a greeting to our friends at the Seminole County Correctional Facility in Sanford, Florida. You're part of our family and we're glad you're here. Let me, uh, let me mention some individuals who are online with us because not only are these groups gathered together, but uh, we've got great folks from uh, various places, including, uh, here's, here's a great one, Valerie from, uh, <laughs> here's a Kentucky boy trying to pronounce a French name, uh, Salon de Provence, how'd I do? Somebody's laughing back here. Uh, Provence, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, and uh, Valerie says this is a place where Nostradamus is buried. Just, that's free. You didn't have to pay for that one at all. Um, also, let me welcome David from Green Bay, uh, Stuart from Jamaica, um, and yeah, and Sandra in uh, Rahway, New Jersey. She says she wishes she could be here in person with us. Chris in South Dakota, anxious to get back into her home. You know, uh, how that's going out there in South Dakota. Robert Wheeler uh, is online and from Fayetteville, Georgia and Edna in Costa Rica. Just to mention a few, many, many other folks online. Would you folks locally here welcome these friends from all around? Hey, we've got some guests here from Brookdale Retirement Community. Uh, where are you folks? Brookdale. Over here, over here. Yeah, welcome to you guys. So glad you're with us. And, and Randy is among you, I think. Randy is the one that, yeah, Randy, thank you so much. Randy arranged the buses and everything else, brought those folks over here. So thank you all for coming and being with us today. We welcome you, glad you're here. The Advent season is a time where many of us want to 
live a generous life. We want to be more generous because it's more blessed to give than receive. And you may have heard that somewhere. And, and uh, there's several ways you can do that here, along with your tithes and offerings. But uh, one of our ministry partners, Christian Help, which is just down the road here, does this great thing called Dove Tree. And it's a simple thing. You just take one of the little doves off the trees in the foyer and get a gift that's been, that someone has requested and someone needs. Each gift is under $25. Uh, you take that, bring it back here. We give it to them. They give it to the family. It's a great way to uh, serve and be generous. Another thing we do is we have a page on our website that's just called Live Generously. And every year, you know, we help as many folks as we can who come here with needs. And we want to be generous together. But sometimes those needs exceed what we're able to do from our budget standpoint. And so we, st we list those needs up on on this page and you can see uh, you, we, you can kind of track the need and how much is there and how much is yet to be raised for that and we've got many families at Northland who make this a ritual with their family they sit down and look through these various needs and then just together as a family decide how they're going to be generous to someone in our community uh, this year so we encourage you to consider that as well and then one last way that you could be really generous we're excited about the fact that on Christmas Eve, which is coming, uh, we get we have thousands of people who come and worship with us in those two days, and we love it that they do. But we need literally hundreds of volunteers to care well for those folks. And so we would invite you to consider being one of those volunteers to pick a service that you might come and worship and another you might come and, and volunteer. And if you stop in the hub or ask your online minister, uh, Mike or Bill online, if you're going to be in Longwood, they can tell you how you could uh, get involved in volunteering for Christmas Eve. And then last but certainly not least, here in Longwood, in the foyer, on the west side of the foyer over there. This weekend, we're sponsoring an education expo. There's a description of it on your worship guide. And uh, this will mostly just benefit you folks who are present here in Longwood. But uh, we have invited a number of schools and tutoring programs, magnet schools, uh, public and private and Christian education. And, and many of those representatives from those schools are here this morning. And we would encourage you, parents, uh, it's a great opportunity for you just to stop out there and see the things, the, the educational opportunities that we have right here in our community. If you have questions about that, uh, it, you can stop. And, and even if you're just curious about what goes on in our community from that standpoint, we encourage you to check that out. Those folks are, would love to talk to you and tell you more about our education going around Central Florida. Right now, would you take a moment and just stand up and meet and greet and welcome the folks around around you. Great job, good job. You may be seated once you have welcomed one another. Thanks for doing that. Hey, one of the benefits for uh, people like me is I get to hear Pastor Joel's sermon five times. And uh, I, mean, it's, I mean that in a good way. It's, it's awesome because every time I hear it, I learn something a little different because I think you do change it every time a little bit. But one of the things that I heard you say last night, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow from you because it fits for where we are right now. Pastor Joel taught us last night that God will use everything in his creation, everything, to accomplish his purposes. It's part of the joy that this creation reflects because all of creation reflects the glory of God. Mahalia Jackson caught that idea in a great gospel song that she wrote. You're going to hear it in just a second. But to be thinking about this, that all of creation would yield, would bend toward the purposes of joy is a great thought. 
G.K. Chesterton said that joy, which is the small publicity of the pagan, is the giant secret of the Christian. And on that night when Jesus was born, the giant secret was about to be revealed when a star stood still. How many of you remember Mahalia Jackson? I tell you, my mama used to love to listen to Mahalia. She loved gospel music, and every time I hear, and I heard Mahalia there, you know, and every time I hear that, that brings me home. 
Speaking of bringing us home, before I get into the sermon text today, um, let me do one more of our little family gatherings, you know. Um, I'm, I'm in ongoing public repentance, um, and I kind of like it. Repentance can have joy, too. As a matter of fact, repentance is joy. Uh, but for, as, as many of you know, because you've heard this before, uh, for 40 years, I was kind of proud of the fact that I never talked about money <laughs> until the Lord came to me a few months ago and said, what are you doing? You know, these are, I've designed my people so that that's one of the ways they can get close to me. And without developing that part of their discipleship, we won't have the same relationship. You've got to teach on this. And so I'm not sure why it took me 40 years to hear that, but here I am. So I've been repenting and, and it's been given these little snippets of lessons so that we can slowly be discipled in an area that will have us walking with God every day we live because we think about money every day we live. So anyhow, you know, I started off by talking about um, the importance of investing for intimacy. Nobody has a close relationship without giving themselves, investing in that relationship. That's where closeness comes from. And anytime you hold back a portion of what you could give, that's a portion that has no closeness in that, uh, uh, of, in that relationship. It doesn't build the relationship, including money. And it is that way with God as well as with people. God wants us to have a close relationship with us. That's, where Jesus, that's why Jesus said, where your treasures, there will your heart be also. What's interested in our money is interested in our heart. And there's part of our heart that will not be given until we give our money to God. And then I went on from there to say, all of us want to have fruitful lives. We want, we want to know that we have changed the world and, and, and that's basically what the, the sermon is going to be about. We want to know that we mattered and we made a difference when we were down here, not just for this world, but for an eternity. And so Jesus taught us to, to, to sow the seed, but to sow it on good soil. To sow it, you know, you're, you're, there's a lot of year-end requests right now. Uh, and all of them are good. I'm getting them just like you are. All of them are good. But there's one that has eternal benefits. And that is when a church, a Christ-centered church, who's very involved with changing the world and its community, you sow your seed in ways that you could never do, just individually, planting one seed here, one seed there, you scatter it. You can watch the benefits, and you'll only know the full benefits after you die. But you can watch the fruitfulness, 30, 60, 100-fold, Jesus said. And then I talked about tithing, about how that's the basic, you know, God says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. Tithe is 10%. That's what tithe means. Um, and 10% and of, of our income, and, and, and this is the storehouse, the temple was the storehouse. And he says, see if I don't, test me on this. Only place in all scripture, God says, test me. Test me. See if I don't open the windows of heaven. I want to open the windows from heaven for you. See if I don't give you more blessings than you can possibly contain. And then I talked about um, his assurance of our provision. You know, so many of us worry about if we're going to have enough. And Jesus said, why are you, why are you doing that? Who of you by worry can add one cubit to your life? It doesn't gain you anything. Seek first the kingdom of God and I'll add all this to it. God knows you need all that. He knows it. Seek first his kingdom and I'll add all of that unto you. I want you to have the security. I don't want you to worry. And then I talked about um, how, how uh, you know, that great prayer of David uh, where, where, where he says, who who am I and who are your people that we can give so generously? There's something about generosity that subtracts the blight of poverty thinking in our lives. You know, poverty doesn't have anything to do with how much money you got. Poverty has to do with how you think. And there are people who have a lot of money, a lot of security, they still have poverty thinking. Because they're always, they're always you know, withholding and they're always, I don't know if I have enough. And the main antidote to that is giving. Because when you give, you go, wait, I don't, have, I don't just have enough for me. I've got enough for them. It just reverses that mentality. And then, I, I'm not going to get to all these, but, but, but I think it was last week, I, I told you that God 
wants to subtract the disease almost. At least it's a sin of covetousness in our lives. We, you know, people who, are, who want what others have, uh, and it's a huge temptation to compare yourself to other people. Oh, I wish I had that. They'll, no matter what they have, they'll never be satisfied with it. And again, the main antidote is, is, is giving, is giving. He not only wants to take away want from our lives, he wants to take away wanting from our lives so that we can be glad about what we have and feel personally blessed from God. Now, one more. And, and, I, and I tell you this one because it has to do with the message today and it'll get me right into the message. There is a scripture in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 that's often misinterpreted, but I wanted to explain it to you so we can interpret it correctly, okay? This is what it says. It's, it says, and of course, Jesus leads up to this by talking about he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And then he says this, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. I'm sorry, this is Paul writing. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now let me tell you how that's often misinterpreted. Many times people think that we should be cheerful about giving itself. And some of you can be like that. But a lot of people, let's be gut level honest, aren't. You know, seriously. You know, it's like, I could have used that somewhere. And so it doesn't make them cheerful. And, and, and I want you to know the cheer should not be attached to the amount that you give. Or even just in, 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 in the money itself, okay? I heard a story once about a little boy whose mama was trying to teach him, you know, to have character. And, and so she, she did this. His Sunday school always took up an offering, just like ours does, and we give it to other kids, you know, who need it more than we do. But she gave him, this is way back when, gave him a nickel and a quarter. And this is what she said to him. She said, now you can give whichever, whichever one of those you want to God. And you can keep the other one for yourself. Well, he knew perfectly well what she wanted him to do. And he intended on doing it. But he got into, got into the thing and, 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 and gave his money and came home. And the mother just waiting at the door, you know, um, and, and said, which one did you give? He said, Mom, he said, I fully intended to give the quarter. He said, but before I gave it, somebody said, God loves a cheerful giver. And I figured I could be a whole lot more cheerful giving that nickel than I could the quarter. <laughs> now, now, I tell you that to tell you, that's the wrong attachment. Let me tell you what this verse really means, because God wants you to have this kind of joy. He wants us to purpose in our heart before we ever get there that our money is going to be important not only in this world but the next. We purpose our money in order to impact earth and heaven. And the joy comes from knowing we have done what we believed was valuable. No matter how that giving, and eventually it, it, giving itself will be fun. But the cheerfulness is the money hasn't controlled us. We've controlled the money. The money hasn't pulled us around. We have used that money to its highest possible purpose. And that gives you joy. That gives you joy. Speaking of which, let me get to this message. Let me get to this message because it's a, it's a remark. I've, I've taught, I've, during this, this Advent season, I said to you, what a remarkable gift God has given you to give the world. Jesus coming into the world didn't just happen through Mary. It still happens through his followers. And all of us need to understand this, that God not only gave us something powerful and eternal to give to the world, which is why we're still here. Because if we didn't have a purpose, God would have taken you out by now. He gave us this gift and he made us this gift for the world. Each one of us very different. But as we get into the Christmas story, you'll see something. You'll see that the circumstances and the world itself, joy to the world, 
God controls the world. The world itself aligns itself through God's manipulation to maximize the gift we have to give and the relationships we have to help us give it. So let me, let me, let me kind of start off. This week we have the most powerful role in the world teamed with a little girl who essentially nobody knew, who felt that she had no power, but was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. She couldn't have felt any power except in the relationship she had just around her. But yet, God would use the mighty and the small to change the world, the small as much as the mighty. It starts out in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, where this is the first sentence. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. So God used someone who had no idea that he was being used by God to get Mary and Joseph into the city to have Jesus, the city that was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would be born in, Bethlehem. By the way, he, in Hebrew, it means house of bread. Bet, bet means, how, uh, means uh, uh, house, Rechem is bread. House of bread. So the bread of the world would be born in a city named House of Bread. But God, I want all of us to understand, uses us all in our part just as equally. He is not a respecter of persons and he links us together. Let me tell you something I've never spoken to you about. Some of you know this. For the last six years, every week, I have written devotions for the President of the United States. I've done that by invitation, and I've never spoken of it because it's just a personal thing that a pastor does. And by the way, please don't go political, but I, we don't do politics here. A job of a pastor is very simple to form a relationship with whomever you can to get them closer to Jesus. Very simple, doesn't matter who it is. I've never mentioned it before and I mention it now and I probably will never mention it again only because it is what he is gonna be reading Tuesday, this one, this, this one this week, um, one of them this week is, is gonna be, uh, he's gonna be reading it Tuesday. I want you to read it before he reads it, okay? So you can just kind of, every one of them comes out of scripture, everyone gives a brief explanation and a brief prayer. And this is how he starts every day. But I want you to read this. The first scripture reading is from Luke chapter two, verse six. And while they were there in Bethlehem, the days were completed for her to give birth. Now, what days are they talking about? Well, the immediate reaction is, well, she's just come to term. They're talking about the days of her pregnancy. They are talking about the days of her pregnancy, but they're not just talking about the days of her pregnancy. They're talking about the culmination of history. Those are the days that are completed. Because this is the second scripture in that devotional. In Galatians chapter four, verses four and five, it says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption. Do you see, they weren't just talking about nine months, they were talking about thousands of years that were born into reality that night. Thousands of years of anticipation. They're not just talking about biography, they're talking about history. And I want you to understand your life isn't just biography, it's history. This is the little commentary that I wrote to him that you'll get in advance. The Bible implies that the events in our lives are a part of a much larger design and purpose. 
Of course, the birth of Jesus is, un is unique. But in a larger sense, history is changed in small beginnings. And great movements are born in the lives of a person determined to redeem what everyone else thought was just the way things are. Historian Will Durant said, most of us spend too much time on the last 24 hours and too little time on the last 6,000 years. We might also add, most of us think our lives are about us and not about God's larger purpose. God sent a savior because history, not just a small group, needed a new start. That same savior continues to make a difference in history through the lives and love of his followers. And then the prayer, I'm asking him to pray and you to pray on Tuesday. Lord, make history different because of you in my life. It's not about the role we think we have. How big is my role? It's how big is my God? It's not about the power we think we have. How much power do I have? It's about how much power does God have to use me in my place where I am in my place of history. You see, our purpose is not just about our lives. It's about how history has been reshaped because we have lived. Our God is so powerful, so complete, that he can use our lives to the same degree of importance that he can use the powerful people we thought really had all of the reins of shaping history. That's not what the Christmas story says. The Christmas story says, yeah, an emperor had a part, but so did a little girl. And both of them were equal in the story. That's what I want us to understand about our lives as well. Shakespeare said this in Hamlet, talking to Horatio. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. Do you know that means that God is in your life, shaping your life, not just for your purposes, not just for your story, but for his story, for his story. And there are certain people we need around us in order to develop that story in us and through us to its maximum potence. Now, I told, uh, you know, I think in terms of categories, just how I, my brain works. And so I, 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 I looked at the birth of the church and I looked at the, at the um, the, uh, the birth of Christ, and then I looked at the birth of the world, remember that? And, and the same Holy Spirit that's, that came over the brooding waters and brought creation out of the chaos was the Holy Spirit who put this little baby in, mother's, in, in his mother's womb. Same Holy Spirit who brought forth the church, the same Holy Spirit who's living in you. Seriously, you don't think you have any power? You don't think you have any prayer? Seriously? Oh, my goodness. But all of us need relationships around us to remind us of that. And so last week, I talked about a couple of kinds of people you need in your life. And, and, and if you don't have them, the church wants to provide them, okay? Um, put up the quadrant, uh, the, the little diagram I drew. And, 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 and we're only going to, but I'm just going to um, um, spend a little bit of time. First of all, we need affirmers. You know, Mary must have thought she was crazy after, after got, Gabriel got done with her. So what's the first thing she does? She goes to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth does for her what she can't do for herself. Elizabeth says to her, no, you're not crazy. I see God in you. God's going to use you. We need affirmers in our lives. We all need for people to look at us and say, no, you're not crazy. I see God in you. Because we will never give that kind of credit to ourselves. We can't affirm ourselves or raise our own self-esteem that high that we think that God could use us in any powerful sense. 
We need those kind of people. And then we need validators. Validators who will vouch on our behalf to someone else. Remember, that was the angel that vouched it to Joseph. It was, it was the, the Ananias and, 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 and Barnabas who, who vouched for Saul. Not only to the Jews, but to the, but to the disciples. We all need validators. Now I want to circle in. I want to, I want to just focus on the fourth category. Because I didn't get to that last week. And this is really important. Because this is the one we don't quite get. We need adversaries and adversarial relationships in our lives. In order to be specifically, individually, personally developed and powerful. It was in the Christmas story. It was at the beginning of the church. It was part of God's plan. They have competing values, but it's God developing you and history through you. There was not only Caesar, there was the council that is mentioned in Acts chapter 5, I think it is. Let's go to that scripture. This this Scripture says that the church was not born in peace. The church was born in struggle, just like a baby is. A church was born in struggle. And so is the power of God through us. It says, after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name and every day in the temple and from house to house and they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think that was God's plan? Let me give you my answer. You bet you it was God's plan. First of all, they got way more attention than they ever would have been had they not been challenged by the, by the religious authorities and the, and the secular authorities. Because all of the crowd is going, man, what's threatening these folks so much? Why are these folks paying so much attention to that? Now, all of a sudden, they have an audience they wouldn't have had before. Now, all of a sudden, they have a character and a perseverance they would not have had before. They have a commitment they would not have before. A commitment that is never born in ease. It's only born in tribulation. A commitment that God wants us to have. As they went on, they were questioned theologically. Do you think half of the New Testament would have happened if people hadn't have been questioning them theologically? Half of the New Testament is theological precision because they're being challenged. That's where we get our Bible from because somebody was challenging them and because somebody was challenging them, they needed to think more precisely and more clearly and deliver an answer that made sense to other people. No, God uses that. And then they were scattered. Why? Just because they like to travel? Out of persecution. Do you think God has anything different in our lives planned? Do you think the troubles that you're going through right now are mere accidents? They are not. They are not. God is using them each differently. None of us have this same experience of problems. Some of them look similar, but because we're so different, they're very different from us. So I want to teach you something today that I think will be of great comfort and should be of great challenge. It certainly will take, I hope, your level of trusting God to 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 a greater depth. See, all of us believe that God generally makes things come out all right because we've read the end of the book. And since we're with God, we're generally going to come out all right. All of us believe that God can make good come out of bad because all of us recite the same, what has become a platitude because, because it's just something to say to make ourselves feel better. 
but none of us have really plummeted its depths, or very few of us have. All things work together for good. That's what, that's what people say, Romans 8, 28. However, that's not the verse. The verse is, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You see how that is designed for the people who have been called into the story of Christ. It's very specific. And so we don't just have kind of a loose providence or even a precision providence. We have a designer who designs each of our lives so that we ourselves can become more powerful in his history and change the world in our own circle more powerfully. I want to teach you something today. You don't just have troubles. You have designer troubles. You've heard of designer genes? You've got designer troubles. You don't just have challenges. You've got designer challenges. Because God is powerful enough and precise enough to come to each one of us and let happen in our lives exactly what we need to spread his word, to show who he is in this world. You remember the story of Joseph? How Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers? Man, that boy had one disappointment after another. Now he added to it himself. He's just kind of a lunkhead. But, but he just kind of get, you know, they sold him into slavery and then he went and he worked hard in the household and got, you know, messed over by the boss's wife. And so then he got thrown into prison and, you know, got a lot of promises, but none of them came through. Disappointment after disappointment. He was disappointed all the way up to being the second most powerful person in the world. That's where his disappointments led him. Why? Because he had designer disappointments. And he knew that. And when his brothers finally came to him and realized who they were standing in front, front of, this brother whom they had offended, who in one word could have them all killed on the spot. In Genesis 50, 20, this is what it says. As for you, you meant evil. <laughs> One of the things I love about God is he's, he, he lets us call it spade a spade, you know? No, they're not just good people who are making a mistake. They're boogerheads. They mean evil. As for you, you meant evil. Watch this. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about the present result to preserve the life of many people alive. Now, let me ask you. Do you think that's blind providence or just somebody saying, oh, I'm going to bring something good? No, God meant it. God saw it coming. God could have stopped it. God meant it. Now, some of you are going to continue to be mad at God for what's happened in your life. You can do that all you want. Or you can say, no, God did what was best ultimately for his story for that person and for me because he's got something greater than I could ever imagine. That's how powerful our God. God meant it for good and not just for the good of your life. Of course not. But for the good of who you will be to other people. Did you ever hear the story about how Braille came into being? I love this. Louis Braille was born into a well-to-do family. And he was loved. He didn't, there was no story of hardship here. He was loved. When he was four years old, he went into his father's workshop. And he was fooling around with the, with the tools. And he got a hold of an awl. You know what that is? A-W-L. It's just a very sh sharp, pointed object usually to poke holes in leather and somehow as any four-year-old can do had an accident and poked himself in the eye that alone is not what ultimately injured him he got infection in that eye and they told this little four-year-old boy don't touch it well how does that work with a four-year-old boy you can't watch a four-year-old boy close enough to have him not touch that 
And so, of course, he would steal away and he would, he would scratch it and he, would, he just wanted to stop the pain and the itching. The infection spread to the other eye and soon he was blind in both eyes. He went away to the Royal Academy for the Blind. He became a master musician. But all the while he was wondering, how do people read? I want to read. I wonder if blind people could ever read. At that same academy, he had heard of some military process by which they called it night reading. That, that is by, by certain shapes that could be felt. They could, they could get messages. So he started thinking, I wonder, I wonder if a system couldn't be devised by which you could have rough surfaces, rough surfaces that actually had words and maybe blind people could someday read. He used a tool to devise that system. Would you like to guess what tool that was? It was the awl, the same tool that had blinded him has let many millions of people read. These are designer tragedies. These are designer tra troubles. They're not just our story. This is not about biography. This is about history. This is not just about character. This is about a divinity that shapes our ends. Let me bring it back to the modern day and then I'll quit. When my boys were going through high school, Lyman High School, two of them went to Lyman, my third one went to a Christian Academy. I hope you'll um, see some of these educational opportunities for kids out here. But the two liked public school and, and both of them joined the wrestling team. Isaac uh, eventually became a really good wrestler because he had a really good coach. Really good coach. The coach was really good because he knew each of the boys individually. And he knew their strengths and their weaknesses. And in as much as he could, he would design their matches to wrestle opponents that they needed in order to be the best personally developed wrestler they could. And, watch this, to be the best team member they could. In those days, we went to state. Lots of the kids went to state. And the team had an almost unblemished record because the coach took personal interest in each individual, developing them not just personally, but as a team member. I loved what the Heisman Trophy winner said last night. This is not my trophy. <laughs> this is my team's trophy. I want you to believe in a big God. I want you to believe that what you're going through is not the blind fate of a chaotic universe. It's the personal development of someone who loves you very much, enough to make your life count in history. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this message. And thank you that you are almighty God. Thank you that you are omniscient and omnipotent, but especially that you are God with us, working on earth every bit as powerfully as you work in heaven. Lord, for those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we give our lives to you again, to be used by you, to trust you for all the details of our lives, even the most hurtful. 
But for those of us who have just believed in you generally and have not yet invited you personally to come into our lives, but want to, let them pray in their heart this prayer as I pray it with my words. Jesus, I know when you died on the cross, you paid for my sins too. And you offer me the gift of salvation. I accept that gift. I could never earn it or deserve it, but I, I accept it. And I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior every day and make of my life whatever you want, not just for my sake, but for those around me who need to see your love. Now, Lord, take these words and apply them to our minds that we might not grow shallow. Apply them to our hearts that we might not grow cold and apply them to our feet that we might be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to pray a benediction that our Lord taught us before you go out and change the world. Pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.